Heartfire by Rose Mackey, Book One of Under Violet Suns. Chapter Five, Accelerated Immunology. Dinara hustled down the corridor to the med bay, the urgent request for a healer flashing on her HUD. She had been sitting with her extended team in the mess hall after the excitement of the possible stowaways, discussing their schedule of physical exams and psych check-ins prior to arrival, when a flashing red icon had appeared on the top right of her field of vision. With a deliberate blink of her eye, she accepted the notification and called up a map to the medbay, the green arrows overlaying her vision as she raced through the ship. Dinara strode into a medbay in chaos. There were two unfamiliar females, the stowaways she presumed, one hissing and waving a small wicked-looking knife at a young soldier as he vainly attempted to work out how to contain her without actually touching her. Lucius was loudly instructing the girls to cease and drop the knife, attempting unsuccessfully to assert some control of the situation, and the mammon was spitting at him to desist in turn. The Felotian officer, Videx Zira, and another Verit officer she did not know, were bodily blocking the mammon from attacking Lucius. Dinara huffed in annoyance, day two on her journey, and she was mere seconds away from an all-out brawl in her own med bay. She hadn't even had a chance to sit down at her own desk yet. Lifting a metal instrument tray from the counter next to the door, she brought it down on the hard surface with a sharp clatter. There was instant silence as they all whirled around in shock. Right, that's quite enough. I will have silence in my med bay. One of the girls opened her mouth to speak and abruptly closed it again with an audible click when Dinara sliced a glare at her. Dinara turned to Lucius. First warrior, situation report. I have received an emergency alert. Grateful at her interruption and keeping a wary eye on the girl with the knife, Lucius Day straightened and replied equally formally. Chief Healer, these two Mammon Lara stowaways, brought on board by Mammon Frey. The cadet has requested a full medical checkup, as it appears that they have not undergone the appropriate medical protocols prior to space travel. Once you have applied whatever medical procedures you deem necessary, they will be taken into custody to await transport back to Verit. I do not consent to this, the Mammon thundered. Dinara pointedly ignored the maman, raising her voice to talk over her. Girls, what age are you? The two girls glanced at each other and drew themselves up to their full height. It would have been considerably more impressive had they topped five feet. As it was, they reminded her of Blurked, a species of small, fluffy-tailed rodents with perpetually grumpy faces. Dinara fought to control her expression and inappropriate laughter. She was sure they would not appreciate the comparison right at this moment. You will address us as Mamon La, the girl with the knife retorted. Dinara nodded seriously. Very well. Mamon La, what ages are you, please? The girls exchanged another glance, and the girl that had not said a word yet nodded once. Trouble took a deep breath, answering for both of them. We have just turned fifteen. The Mamon inserted herself between Dinara and the girls, evading the Felosian officer holding her with a deft twist of her wrist. You will address any questions to me. I brought them here and am responsible for their well-being. Dinara grit her teeth and plastered a professional smile on her face. I see, are you their mother or legal guardian? No, I am their maman. They go where I say. Dinara clung to her patience. Can you evidence your legal guardianship? I will require proof such as a writ of transfer of guardianship from their parents, adoption papers or permission to travel documentation. Frey was indignant. Those things are not required for Mamon La. The bond of the Mamon is ancient and sacred. Where I go, they go. Dinara shook her head. Verit is a member of the Colonial Alliance, and those things are required by Alliance Galactic Law. These Mamon La are minors, and by your own admission you are not their parent, nor can you evidence legal guardianship or permission. Therefore this is potentially a case of child smuggling. The Mamon stepped back in shock as Dinara's calm recitation continued. However, that is an issue for justice to sort out. What is relevant at this time is that under Colonial Alliance medical laws, as you are under suspicion of a criminal act relating to child smuggling, you may not act as medical proxy for them. The maman turned a distressing shade of beetroot, and Dinara considered that she may need to schedule a blood pressure checkup for her in the near future. The maman la had fallen silent, visibly shocked at this female openly defying a senior maman. Lucius nearly cheered. He had never seen a maman put in her place so effectively. Maman were vicious, difficult and demanding, 
and Dinara had neatly eviscerated one of the most respected and feared with just a few words. Maman Frey, please step out of the med bay while I undertake preliminary medical examinations. Maman Lass, the first warrior will stay with you for your comfort and safety while we determine who will represent your interests. Maman Frey snarled, I will not. Dinara's voice was a whip, her patience at its end. Maman, you will step out of the med bay or I will have the officer remove you. It's your choice. The maman's lips thinned in anger as she gauged the resolve in Dinara's eyes. After a moment she nodded, and head held high with stiff dignity, she shrugged off Vera's guiding hand as she ushered her out. Dinara turned to the mamon lass. Now please follow me to a cubicle. First warrior, please remove their weapons and stand guard inside the door. Lucius nodded and held out his hand to Trouble, who glared at him for a moment before relenting and dropping the knife onto his outstretched hand. Dinara winced, considering if she would have to reattach one or more fingers. However, Lucius deftly caught the blade in mid-air and spun it around in one smooth move to drop it into an empty sheath on his belt. He smiled smugly at the girl before bowing and gesturing with his hand for her to precede him. Dinara opened an iso bay and motioned the two girls inside, Lucius assuming a position to the right of the door. His bulk took up a significant chunk of the available space around the scan bed in the small isolation bay, but she felt safer with him there. She had no desire to be stabbed if the girls were hiding any more weapons. One of you please sit on the chair, and the other lie on the scan bed. I need to complete a detailed assessment for each of you, which will take several minutes. As Trouble hopped onto the bed and Quiet One sat in the chair, Lucius struggled to get his surging desire under control. From the moment Dinara had walked into the med bay, his entire being had focused on her. Her scent was intoxicating, and the gentle strength and calm manner in which she had dealt with the maman had intrigued him. The heady mixture of compassion, intelligence and strength, an enticement that he could not ignore. He positioned himself so that he could watch both girls and Dinara. He listened to her low, husky voice question the maman lass. Please describe for me what treatments and procedures you have undertaken to prepare you for space travel, and specifically for Colony 29. As Trouble lay on the bed, the diagnostic array arm unfolded and extended its network of translucent fibres over her. The scanner started to cycle through its routine, making gentle clicking and whirring sounds, occasionally emitting a hum or a flash of light. Trouble spoke, staring straight up at the ceiling, refusing to dignify them with eye contact. We were treated with a serum designed to enhance our digestive processes to enable us to consume food from Colony 29. We were also inoculated with the combined Colonial Alliance vaccine for interstellar travel, which covers all known major viruses. Dinara made the note in their charts. I see. Have you undergone any anti-gravity training to prepare you for emergencies in space? Where are your jumpsuits? Trouble remained silent. I'll take that as a no. The jumpsuits are not a fashion statement. Their AI monitoring routine interfaces with my medical monitoring program and lets my team know if you are experiencing any distress, but also if your system is lacking in any necessary nutrients or minerals. Prolonged space travel is known to cause reduction in key nutrients necessary for human life, such as hematocrit, serum iron, ferritin saturation, transferrin, and serum 25 hydroxycholecalciferol. Bone loss, compromised vitamin D, and oxidative damage are among critical nutritional concerns for extended space travel. The suit interacts with the computer and adds the required nutritional supplements to your normal meal plans so that you will never notice a lack. During Dinara's recitation, the Mamon Lass visibly shrank into themselves. When Trouble spoke again, her voice was quiet, much less imperious. We are not human. We are Verit. Dinara was having none of it. The Verit colony is a Gen 2 Earth colony, as is Felosia. The base human template is the same. It is why we agreed to co-sponsor as we can interbreed. While there has been some genetic drift and modification over the past few hundred years, the essentials are still there. Human template species are not designed for long-term space travel and need significant medical support to remain in optimal health. Lucius nodded slowly in agreement. It was basic spacefaring health knowledge given to all young Verit males. Whatever reason you had for doing this, and one assumes that it is compelling, or you would not have placed yourself at risk, this decision to stow away is medically ill-advised. 
the scanner beeped to indicate its completion, and Dinara moved to review the results on the medical data pad, motioning for Trouble to jump off of the bed and Quiet One to jump on as the cycle restarted. More so because it appears that your digestive enhancement was not entirely effective. Trouble scoffed. That is unlikely, Healer. The Mammon Convocation undertook the research themselves. We have the best scientists in the sector. Dinara clucked her tongue. Sloppy research, apparently. I don't know where you got your sample to reverse engineer. But your researchers have not accounted for several key protein strains, nor have they introduced the stabiliser we added to the official batch. Without it, your system is gradually reverting back to your base state. The human template is highly resistant to this kind of change. Digestion is a complex biochemical process, including a delicate bacteria balance. Even though your system is attempting to revert, it will be unable to complete the process effectively without help. You could end up not being able to digest any food at all. The girls wore an identical expression of horror. Did you experience any uncomfortable symptoms during your digestive enhancement process? Both girls shook their head, eyes bulging. They had finally begun to realise how much danger they were in. Did it not occur to you that the males had all experienced moderate to severe digestive symptoms during the transition? They nodded. And it didn't make you question why you didn't, she prompted. Trouble lifted her chin in an echo of her previous defiance. Females are resilient. We are stronger than our male counterparts have a higher pain tolerance. Lucia snorted in barely hidden laughter, then quieted as he received three identical dark looks from the females. Dinara quirked a smile at him which she hid with a polite cough. While that statement is medically correct, it is not relevant in this situation. You didn't get the correct treatment, therefore you did not experience the symptoms. Dinara paused as another thought occurred to her. Didn't you see your mammon go through the transition and wonder why you didn't? Another long pause that had Dinara looking up sharply from the data pad. She didn't either. Tell me that she took the official treatment. Oh, she said, eyes wide as she answered her own question. Of course she didn't. That's where the convocation got the sample to work from. But how? They were officially administered. It was Lucius's turn to cough politely, and Dinara glanced at him, motioning for him to speak. If I may, Healer, it was administered by male medical techs. It is likely that she just ordered the male medic to hand over the sample to administer to herself later, and they did it. Dinara shook her head at the sheer stupidity of it. If this had been discovered on the colony, they may not have had sufficient medical stores or capabilities to correct the damage. All three could have died for this act of folly and pride. All right, ladies, I mean Mamon Lass. Do you have a view on who you would like to be your guardian proxy while this mess is sorted out? Another exchange of looks, before Quiet One spoke for the first time. We would prefer the Maman. She really does look out for our best interests, but we understand the situation. In the event that it is not possible for her to represent us, we would ask you to do so. Dinara's jaw dropped. Me? Why? Surely the Prime or one of your own males would be better? Quiet One was insistent. With all due respect, Healer, we would prefer a female. Males on Verit. We love and value them, but we don't expect them to make decisions like these. Dinara glanced at Lucius to see his reaction, and he didn't flinch. Huh. Apparently that was correct. You think that Lucius here would not act in your best interest? Lucius grimaced, considering how to respond without divulging information not normally provided to outsiders. Healer. A prime may resist an order or disagree with a maman if he strongly believes that it would put a female in jeopardy, but the rest of us, the Maman Las, are correct. We would be bound by our honour to follow their orders. Dinara's brain clunked for a moment at the sheer stupidity. You can't be serious. They are children. They need the guidance and protection of a responsible adult. He looked uncomfortable. The expectation is that their supervising Maman would provide such guidance. Dinara hummed in disapproval. I see. The Mammon Lass had been watching their discourse in fascination, intrigued by the respectful manner in which the healer interacted with Lucius and listened to his views on the subject. Quiet One chimed in again. The genders have their roles, and females are the dominant. We make the decisions. You would be bound by your ethical guidelines to do the best for us, and you have been open with us thus far. Dinara was impressed by the girl's insight, and began to see a little of why the Verit males regarded their females the way they did. 
to grow up knowing that you would be responsible for the males around you, all the while being expected to breed as much as possible, would provide a sharp dose of reality at a young age. Still, they were children. Teenagers were not known for their discerning life choices or good judgment. Very well, if that is your preference. She lifted the medical data pad and with a few swipes commenced the recording. This is Danara Passal, Chief Healer of Colony 29, on board the Ardrak 4022-1221-1030. This is a recording of Guardian Proxy nomination. She turned to the girls. Please state your names, planet of habitation, and nomination of Guardian Proxy for the record. This will not become a binding appointment under Alliance law until endorsed by Cadet Moral Lien as Governor of Colony 29. As minors, your guardian proxy has full authority to make any and all decisions relating to your well-being, housing, education, health and finances, until you reach your majority, including in the situation where you are incapacitated. Trouble took the data pad. I, Mamon La Bilel of Verit, request Mamon La Frey of Verit as guardian proxy. If this is not possible under Alliance law, I request Chief Healer Danara Passal of Felosia as alternate guardian proxy. Quiet One stepped up to her side. I, Mamon Lascara of Verit. Once completed, Danara stepped to the ISO bay door and exited with the girls in tow with Lucius bringing up the rear. Lucius, please request that the Kadek, Prime and Mamon join us. She was cut off as the Kadek walked in with the Prime and Mamon in tow. Ah, never mind. I see that everyone is already here. The Kadek nodded to her. Chief Healer, have you completed your scans? Please appraise me of the situation. Yes, Kadek. Danara quickly brought the Kadek up to date on the situation, noting the Kadek's glare at the Mamon when she got to the bit on child smuggling. I have completed the medical scans. I have determined that the Mamon Las have had their standard colonial vaccinations. Therefore, they are not a contamination risk. We will not need to decontaminate the ship and delay our arrival. There was an audible sigh of relief. However, both the Mamon Las and the Mamon have received a flawed digestive and immune enhancement protocol. They will be unable to process Colony 29 proteins, and the enhancement was so flawed there is already evidence that their own normal digestive processes have been seriously compromised. I recommend immediate medical intervention for all three. The Maman looked deeply shocked, and surreptitiously reached out to grip the Prime's arm to steady herself. Further, it appears that none of the females in the Verit delegations have worn a jumpsuit, which means that their needs have not been monitored and menu adjusted to meet them. There is already evidence of nutritional deficiencies developing. My medical advice is that all persons must be assigned and wear an AI-enabled jumpsuit. The cadet nodded again. Finally, the Mamon Las have requested that I undertake Guardian Proxy until the situation is resolved, and I have accepted. I am streaming you the request now. The cadet paused for a moment to review the requests in her HUD. Approved. You are their Guardian Proxy until we determine otherwise. Prime. We need your approval as well. Brune hesitated, looking at his mate a moment before nodding. Very well. Approved. Although this is only temporary. We will receive confirmation of guardianship imminently from Verit. Danara shrugged her shoulders, resisting the urge to massage the tension from her neck. I request that the girls are assigned quarters in the Felosian section, with a round-the-clock security detail, each a Felosian and Verit officer. They are children. We can do better than an isolation cell. I will need to begin their treatments immediately. For now, I will ensure that they can digest food from their native planet. I will not commence treatment to enable them to digest Colony 29 proteins, as I assume you will be sending them home. For the Maman, I will need to conduct the full Colony 29 protocol. Fry's look was venomous. No, I decline. I do not consent for you to treat me. Danara extended her empathy senses to Frey, taking in her anger and fear lurking under the icy surface. Very well. Would you consent to Odrun? Stiffly, she nodded. Very well. Although I will observe so that you cannot order him to do anything that would be harmful to you or others. The Maman's look was acid, and Danara knew that she had been right in her assumption of the female's motives. This will be deeply unpleasant for you, Maman. I recommend that we place you in an induced coma for the duration. The males took weeks to go through the protocol. You will only have a few days. I do not consent. Verit females are strong. I will endure. Danara sighed. Very well, let me know if you change your mind. I can induce coma at any time. The cadet turned to Lucius. Get it done, please. 
liaise with Gadek Lenora to arrange quarters and Gadek Sraya to organize around the clock guard. He nodded and bowed formally. Danara reached out to touch his arm as he moved away and caught his hiss at her touch. They may stay here with Zira and Tarlac in the interim until quarters are assigned. We may as well administer the first treatment today. It will take me an hour or so to prepare the initial infusion. Accessing her HUD, she summoned Odran. Odran will be here momentarily to see to the maman. We must commence her treatment immediately. Ladies, please return to the ISA room. Lucius motioned to the girls, who followed obediently. The maman entered a second ISA room, pointedly ignoring the prime that followed her, and the cadet left. Zira and Tarlac took up security positions, Tarlac at the med bay entrance and Zira at the ISO room door, which Lucius sealed once the girls were inside. Dinara moved to the other end of the med bay through the open diagnostic area outside the office of the chief healer to where the dispensary was located, to start selecting the compounds she needed to prepare the infusion. She sucked in a deep breath, grateful for the moment of peace, away from the drama and swirling emotional currents that kept brushing against her empathic senses. A deep voice rumbled. Thank you for your care of the Mammon lass. Danara spun around to see Lucius had followed her into the dispensary area. He stood, looming in the doorway, the artificial lights catching the burnished gold and bronze of his skin. She swallowed, her mouth suddenly dry with anxiety. No problem at all. It is my job, and despite their bluster they are just scared children. She flashed him what she hoped was a polite smile as she returned to rummaging for the medication, and he stood there silently, just watching her. She felt his admiration emanating for him, and preened a little at his appreciation of her, honest and bright. Awkwardly trying to think of something else to say, she asked, Did you know them on Verit, the young maman? A little. I am first warrior of the Dathalka clan, which Frey leads. I saw them occasionally at mealtimes with her. It's not uncommon for Mamon La to live with a senior maman to gain experience, as these girls did but we do not interact with them unless they approach us. I have never conversed with them before today. I see. She turned to regard him, leaning against the cabinet. Does it not bother you that they don't believe you can be trusted with decisions like that? He shrugged slightly, and it communicated a world of feeling. Danara wondered if he was aware of the simmering resentment she could sense under his cool facade. Surely, as a leader of warriors, you must make life and death decisions every day. He nodded. And I assume you are competent or you would not be named First Warrior. If you can be trusted with those decisions, it seems obtuse for them to compartmentalise in that way. He smiled arrogantly at her. I am a First Warrior. He stroked his animal fur, which she had successfully avoided looking at until now, and pointed out a series of gleaming metal pins and buttons along the edge. Each of these represents a successful campaign. Danara shuddered and turned back to the medicine cabinet, trying not to think about him wearing a dead animal. Lucius prowled up to her, quiet and fast like a panther from old earth. Why do you do that? Suddenly he was very close. She could feel the heat radiating from him. He had moved so fast and silently that she had not heard him take a step. She spun around, backing up into the medication shelving, knocking several boxes to the floor. Do what? she stammered. He huffed at her. Shudder and turn away. What displeases you so? I saw you do the same thing when you regarded me at the introduction social event. He was very, very close. She could sense his energy. It was distinctly feline. Curiosity with a contained violence and ruthless intelligence. It was highly unusual, and nothing in all her years of experience had prepared her for the closeness of such a male. He seemed to suck up all the air in the room. Oh, it's nothing, she whispered. He regarded her, his eyes deepening from their usual pale blue to a dark navy. She was transfixed at the sight. Why do your eyes do that? Is it an evolutionary adaption or a deliberate genetic alteration? He chuckled darkly, amused at her fascination. Deliberate alteration. It allows us to see minute biochemical and heat changes, a useful enhancement for a warrior. It also allows me to see when you lie. I saw your displeasure at the first meet yesterday as well. He cocked his head at her, studying her reactions, attempting to determine the source of her distress. The dark stranger within him was demanding that he find the source of the problem, kill it for her, and lay it at her feet in tribute. Something displeases you, healer. Inform me of it, my lady, and I will remedy it immediately. His voice was pure magic. Could you... 
Could you back up a bit, please? She gasped out, and he took two measured steps back to place himself against the opposite wall, as far away as he could get in the small space. He was immediately contrite. My apologies. I didn't mean to frighten you. I observed you standing close to Odrin yesterday, and assumed it was acceptable in your culture. I would never touch you without your permission. She detected a faint thread of hurt in his emotional resonance as he continued. Or perhaps it is me you don't wish to stand so close to. His gaze was distant, examining her reactions in his mind before snapping back to peace her. Yes, that is it. It is I that distresses you. I shall remedy this by removing my presence. He spun on his heel, intending to march off. Danara reached out to him. No, wait. She grabbed his jumpsuit-clad arm and he jumped back like a scalded cat. It is not you. You do not displease me. He remained serious, gazing down at her, poised to leave. It is your fur, she spluttered, embarrassed. His eyes opened wide in confusion, her reaction entirely unexpected. Reaching over his shoulder, he plucked out a long copper braid and held it out for her to examine. She reached out a finger to stroke the burnished braid, wondering what she was doing and realising that it was now her that was standing inappropriately close. The braid was incredibly soft and smelled faintly of pine trees. Once more he rumbled, his voice low and soft. My fur, the colour is not so different to yours. He motioned to her blonde hair. Do your males not have fur? Dinara giggled. No, not that fur. The one you wear, from a dead megafauna. She gestured vaguely to the white fur wrapped around his torso. Ah, my Toluca, this is ceremonial for my people. We are a predatory variant species of human, and Verit is very cold. We hunted the Dathalka for meat in the early days of our colony establishment, and it has become traditional. It is a sign of strength and virility to wear one. The white-furred Dathalka are very rare. They are larger, and it takes much skill to take one down. I see. She tried for polite interest, but apparently wasn't as good an actress as she thought when he challenged her again. You dislike it. Why? On Felosia, we do not kill creatures if we can avoid it. We attempt to live in harmony with our environment. He grimaced, appalled. You do not eat meat. Only if there is nothing else available. Killing for food we understand and accept as part of the natural order. But we do not kill wastefully and respect the animals we kill. We would never wear their skins. It is considered disrespectful. He nodded in understanding. We also respect the animals we kill and believe that by wearing their skins, something of their spirit lives on in the world. Still, if it makes you uncomfortable, I will remove it. Danara felt instantly guilty for making him uncomfortable with displaying something that clearly had a lot of cultural significance for him. No, we'll all need to adjust our views to integrate our cultures. I'll learn to deal. Thank you for explaining. A slow smile. Really, I do not mind removing it for you. You may command me to remove whatever you wish. His voice was low, intimate, and he flashed her a wide, wolfish grin that was entirely unexpected. It catapulted him from brooding good looks into stellar hotness category. We only wear them for formal occasions. He cocked his head at her, his eyes cat bright with mischief. We wore them specifically to impress you. Danara's joy was like bubbles inside her, caught in his unusual gaze. Didn't work out too well for you, huh? He shrugged. I don't know. It gave us this opportunity for this cultural exchange and provided you an opportunity to admire some of my better qualities. He motioned down, where she realised that she now held his braid possessively and had been absent-mindedly stroking it. First warrior, chief healer, what is going on? They both started, Danara springing back and rocking the shelving as she once again bumped into it, knocking yet more boxes onto the floor. At this rate, she was going to need a medic to apply a topical bruise remover to her shoulders. My apologies, first warrior, chief healer, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Odrin stood in the doorway a grin and a look of false innocence undermining his attempt at an apology. I hope it was nothing important. Lucius growled, an honest-to-goddess growl, and moved to block her from Odrin's view while Dinara bent down to grab the boxes on the floor to hide her scarlet cheeks. He waited until she had gathered herself before bowing to her. Healer, I will take my leave to organise the security arrangements. Dinara nodded, unable to look at him as he moved away. Odrin stood in the door for a moment, still grinning. Danara waited for him to say something. So, Lucius, he teased. Oh, shut up, and stop grinning like that, Danara shot back. I have work for you, take these. 
She thrust the compounds required for the infusion into his hands, and together they walked out to the med bay to start the treatments. Over the following days, the colonists fell into a waiting pattern. Odrin commenced the mammon's treatment, and it was just as unpleasant as the males had been. Dinara gently patted Frey's face with a cold cloth as she rested between bouts of vomiting, a metal basin propped against her. Bilal and Skara sat in the iso bay with her, eyes huge in their faces as they watched their mentor convulse with another wretch. Two days of near-constant vomiting had wrung the small female dry, and she was pale as the sheets around her. Bilal, go to the mess hall and collect another cup of ice chips, please. The girl sprinted off, grateful for the opportunity to be away from the sick smell. Dinara swapped out the basin for a new one and went to the med bay biohazard disposal to empty it, passing Odrin sitting at the duty healer desk. As soon as he saw Dinara, he bounced up. How is our maman? Dinara sighed tiredly. The same. She has deteriorated a lot faster than the males. I think the inferior adjustment agents she cooked up aren't interacting well with the correct ones. I'd like you to examine her as a second opinion. Odrin's eyes opened wide, the whites visible all around. You know I can't. She's ordered me away. That was true enough. Despite the maman's original insistence that Odrin treat her, within a few hours of the onset of the digestive distress, she had decreed that no male could witness her condition. Still, this couldn't go on. Agreed. But I need a second opinion nonetheless. The antiemetics are not effective, and I may need to induce a coma until the process is completed. Odrin paced restlessly. You don't understand, Dinara. It's not just that she's declined consent for me to treat her as her healer. She is a mammon and I am male. I cannot go against her orders. Dinara huffed. Even if it causes harm to her health. He shrugged helplessly. Even then, their word is law. Dinara racked her brain trying to remember anything that could help from her studies of Verit culture. Is there anyone that can countermand her orders? Odrin suddenly found a plate on the floor fascinating, and Dinara pounced. There is who? She held his gaze for a long moment before he sighed, defeated. Her mate has the right to countermand the order if he believes her life is in danger. Dinara sucked in a breath. I see. Except Prime Frey has conveniently removed himself from the med bay at her order so that he can't countermand it. Dinara began to understand just how complex the male-female dynamics must be on Verit. Hearing the medbay portal open, she turned expecting Bilel back with another glass of ice chips, but instead came face to face, well, face to chest, with Lucius. His unusual eyes expanded, taking her in as he did every time he came for a report, and she schooled her expression to a professional calm, quashing her irritation. Twice a day for the past week, Lucius had attended medbay for a situation report to take back to the Prime. At first she had hoped that he would reach out to her, even a few friendly words would have been welcome. She'd noted that after that first day, none of the males had worn their furs. Word must have got around. Their moments in the dispensary had hinted at the potential for a deeper connection, and she had welcomed any sign that he wished to extend their association. While she wasn't in the market for a mate, a long, hard romp with the delicious warrior was exactly the kind of healing, no-strings invitation she could see herself accepting. Throughout the days she had found her mind drifting again and again to that moment, stroking his copper braid and gazing into his navy eyes. Instead, he had retreated into the manner of a formal, controlled warrior. It was incredibly annoying and had been highly effective in quelling her interest in him. She forced herself to greet him with a bright, professional smile. First warrior, come for the morning update for the Prime? Yes, healer. His voice was equally controlled. Fantastic. She was more than ready to give the Prime a report directly, preferably at significant volume. Excellent timing. I wish you to fetch the Prime here immediately. I need to discuss his mate's condition with him in person. He frowned at her, wary displeasure radiating from him. That is not possible, healer. The Maman has ordered him away from her presence. Dinara bared her teeth in an approximation of a smile. Then take me to wherever he is. I need a second opinion from Odrin, and the Maman has declined consent for him to treat her. I require the Prime to overrule that. Lucius looked about helplessly, and locked eyes with Odrin, who shrugged. Healer, you don't realise what you are asking. For a mate to countermand a Maman's orders is only done in the most exigent of circumstances. Mates had been executed in the past for overstepping their bounds. 
He considered Dinara closely. In their brief acquaintance, he had not considered her flighty or prone to impulsive orders as many of the mamans. Is it your medical opinion that the mamans' life is at stake? Dinara pondered for a moment, her pale eyes clouding as she weighed the question. He liked that about her, that she did not simply respond without thought. Be honest with yourself, he thought. You like everything about her. It is. She is small, and the transition is much more challenging than the ones the males underwent, due to her ineffective previous treatments. Lucius winced. His males had been bedridden for days, and many of them had prayed to the goddess for a swift end. If the maman was going through worse, he could easily believe that her life could be in jeopardy. Decision made, he bowed sharply. Very well, I will fetch him here. Dinara nodded and waited for him to leave. He hesitated for a moment, opening his mouth to speak before shaking his head and thinking better of whatever he was going to say. Is there something else, first warrior? Looking at her, he once again silenced himself. Every time he visited the med bay, he had tried to think of something meaningful to say, something to allow him to get to know her better, to recapture the piercing intimacy of their previous interaction, but every time he came up short. His suspicion of his unusual reaction to her warred with his increasing attraction. In their every encounter he was more impressed. She was warm and caring with the maman, intelligent and incisive in her commentary, and her calm, practical manner was so unlike the aggressive females of Verit, not wanting to sound like a babbling fool, especially here in her place of power where she was so frighteningly competent, he had elected to stay silent. He was not an idiot. Despite his lack of familiarity and general disgust of females, he understood that this strategy had sharpened her temper at him. No, healer. He bowed his head briefly again and turned to take his leave when he was abruptly shoved back into Dinara as Bailel came barreling through the open portal. Lucius and Dinara bounced in an awkward tangle of limbs against the opposite bulkhead, Lucius turning slightly to take the hit on his shoulder and hip, holding her upright, his arm curving around her. For a single moment he felt her soft curves pressed against the length of him, and he felt the searing contact down to his bones, scouring him from the inside out. She fit perfectly against him, all lush softness. Maman la, have a care! Odrin's voice was a whip. Oh, my apologies, Healer Odrin. Dinara, I brought the ice. He could not feel the heat of her through her jumpsuit, but he was acutely aware of her intoxicating scent, and for a single insane instant he was reluctant to let her go. She let her hand linger for a moment around the width of his biceps, under the guise of steadying herself, and his breath caught in his throat, his heart spiking at her closeness. Now was not the time. He refused to act on these feelings surrounded by prying eyes. Thank you, Bailel. Please take the ice chips into the maman and encourage her to take a couple. I will be in momentarily. Dinara gently extracted herself from Lucius's grasp. Thank you again, first warrior. I will await the prime. Dinara stepped away towards the dispensary to give herself a moment. Odrin came under the pretense of checking his shoulder. Smooth, Lucius, very, very smooth. Have a care, Odrin. You are still under my command. You may not be my La anymore, but I can still dump you on the ground. Odrin rolled his eyes at him. You're meant to be the leading example of Verit manhood. Please, let me give you some pointers. It's excruciating seeing our gloried war hero stumble over his own tongue twice a day. He batted Odrin away. I am not stumbling. I am being respectful of her in her place of work. You might want to try it once in a while rather than chattering like a child. You're afraid and screwing this up, he said bluntly. Lucius finally looked at Odrin seeing the insightful healer that he had grown into, rather than the gangly youth he had trained. Has she said something? Odrun sighed in exasperation. She doesn't need to. She was clearly interested the other day. Why have you not expressed your interest again? You must know that many of the boys are attracted to her. This is what we came here for, to meet mates outside of the strictures of Verit society. It's not that easy, Odrun scowled at him. Actually, it is. If you would just get out of your own damned way... Further conversation was interrupted by the sounds of Dinara returning, and Lucius chose discretion as the better part of valour, and exited before he could make a bigger fool of himself. The Prime and Lucius arrived some time later, and Dinara met them in one of the medbay consult rooms. Without any preamble, she launched in. It is my medical opinion that your mate's health is deteriorating, and that her life could be in danger if we continue with the current treatment protocol. 
The prime winced at her sharp tone, decades of conditioning under the maman making him excruciatingly sensitive to her emotions. Dinara ignored his reaction. She had no patience for his emotions after his days of absence while his mate was seriously ill. My recommended protocol is an induced coma. I require a second opinion from a senior healer to prescribe that protocol. However, your mate has declined consent for Odrin to observe her. At her recitation, the Prime looked increasingly pained, and Dinara's anger drained from her. She could sense the exhaustion pouring from him, and the dark circles under his eyes and rumpled clothing told their own story. She paused for a moment, reassessing him. Perhaps it was not disinterest that had kept him away, but some deeper social construct she had yet to navigate. She simply could not imagine a society where a male was forbidden to attend his seriously ill mate. Despite her plea, the Prime remained stubbornly silent. She extended her empathic senses to him and sensed a deep well of frustration. He wanted to act, but something still held him back. Gently, she placed her hand on his shoulder and his eyes widened in surprise at the contact. Prime, I can sense you wish to assist her. What holds you back? He shook his head in denial. You cannot understand what you ask of us. Then help me understand. He scrubbed his hand over his eyes. She commands, I follow. This is as the goddess wills. Dinara spoke softly. Even if her commands lead to her own death. He shook her off and moved to the window of the consult room. He couldn't see into the maman's chambers, but he stared fixedly at the door to her room just across the hall for long minutes, fingers flexing and clenching in agitation. Eventually he spoke. You are sure her life is in danger? Dinara clenched her hand behind her back where he couldn't see. Yes, Prime. The Prime sighed heavily. Very well, I consent to both Odrin and the coma, if he agrees with your prognosis. Thank you. Dinara took in his slumped shoulders. Would you like to see her? He didn't turn around, just continued staring at the closed door to the room where his mate lay. When he eventually spoke, his voice was small. It would not... distress her. Dinara regarded him gravely. I suspect she would appreciate your support. He looked at the ground as if contemplating the striations in the deck plates, and Dinara watched the muscles tense in his jaw. I will see her. Dinara rose and motioned for him to follow her towards the Iso Bay. From outside the doorway they could hear the maman's laboured breathing, interrupted by painful dry retching. They waited for it to subside before Dinara ventured in first. Maman, you have a visitor. No visitors, came the faint reply. I suspect you will want to see this one. Dinara stepped aside and ushered the prime in. At the sight of him the maman tried to sit upright. I instructed you to leave me. She patted at her lank hair feebly. Hush, my lady, just this once. He went to her bedside and sunk down into the chair, big palm stroking her sweat-damp hair back from her forehead. Just this once, lean on my strength. I promise after this is over I will not think less of you. At his whispered words, the maman let out a sob and her luminous crystal eyes filled with tears. Dinara stepped out and motioned to Bailel and Skara to leave, giving them a few moments of privacy. All too soon the interlude was broken by more retching. Dinara re-entered and resumed dabbing the maman's head with the cloth. Maman Frey, I will be blunt, this is not progressing well. Thank you for the startling insight, healer. I see your decade of training was well spent. The Prime tisked but struggled to hide a smile at his mate's sass. Your condition continues to deteriorate. It is my opinion that the previous treatments you have taken are now interfering with this protocol. I would like to bring Odrin in as a second opinion to confirm my diagnosis. If supported, I will induce a coma until the worst has passed. No, no more males. Increase the dose of the antiemetic. Dinara would not be deterred. You are already well beyond the recommended dose. It is not effective. Increase the antiemetic. And where did you do your decades worth of medical training? Dinara inquired with a raised eyebrow. The maman glared at her, before sighing back into her pillows, her strength exhausted. Then place me in a coma, but I will not consent to any further males observing my weakened state. With a moment of piercing insight, Dinara realised just how terrifying it must be for the female to feel so powerless, for someone who had relied on her projection of perfection to control those around her. Very well, Maman. Dinara complied, and the Prime sat by his mates beside until she slipped under. Brune's voice was husky. Healer? Hmm? 
I know she's not perfect, but she is a glorious female, my mate. You may not agree with her methods, but she loves our people and has led our clan for decades, caring for us all. Watch over her as if she were your own sister. I would not like her light to leave this universe yet. He held her gaze with a solemnity that was not feigned. As if she were my own sister, Dinara promised. Lucius watched Dinara from outside the medbay room and marvelled at the depth of her compassion to a female that, at best, had displayed her a stunning lack of respect, and at worst could be a child smuggler by the standards of Philosia. More and more he was becoming intrigued by the healer, capable of facing down a maman in a rage, yet also capable of compassion to her enemy. So unlike the mamans of his homeworld, who he knew from bitter experience, would not have stirred themselves to give a dying enemy water, unless there was something in it for them. Belatedly, he realised that Bailel was standing silently, also observing beside him. These Felotians, they are so unlike the mammon I have trained with. How can such compassion be real? How can they survive in this world with such soft hearts? She turned to him, honest confusion in her eyes, and it struck him that for all her hissing, troublesome manner, she was still just a child. Do you think them soft, Mamola? I'm not so sure. The Kadek seems to have plenty of steel when required. A maman would have had us all executed for breaching her ship and flouting her rules as an example to others. Lucius nodded. He had seen evidence of such ruthlessness over and over again. Instead, she allows us to remain unfettered and provides medical care. Even when pronouncing judgment on us, she considered our emotional state and made allowances. Perhaps their gifts make them grow up differently and consider how others may feel, because they can also feel it, he offered. Perhaps. It seems an unusual genetic gift to breed empathy and compassion into a species. What could they have been thinking, hobbling their daughters so? He snorted, receiving a glare from the young Mamon La. You should continue reviewing the dossier provided on the Philosians. After diplomats, negotiators and counsellors, Philosia's primary interstellar employment is as bodyguards. When you can feel others' emotions, you are able to sense danger and deceit. Seems like an extremely useful adaptation to me. Bailel nodded again and stiffened abruptly, realising that she had been casually conversing with a male unsupervised, entirely against protocol. Thank you for your words, First Warrior. That will be all. Turning in dismissal, it took her a few seconds to realise that he remained. You are dismissed, Warrior. Lucius stiffened at her tone, but kept his voice deliberately mild. Respectfully, Mamon La. You are not in charge here. I remain under orders from the Prime and the Chief Healer. I will stay until I am no longer required. Bailel's eyes blazed in anger, her small frame angling towards him in the precursor to the Verit attack pose. There it was, the streak of cruelty that defined all Maman. Before she could retort and punish him for his insolence, Dinara reappeared. Thank you, Bailel. You and Skara may leave for a rest period. The maman is in an induced coma and will remain such until after we reach the colony. Return tomorrow at ten hundred hours to continue your treatments. Bailel gave a final hard look at Lucius, before she nodded gracefully at the healer and swept away. Dinara turned searching eyes on Luquis. Did she harm you? What? Did she harm you? Are you injured? It dawned on him that she must have sensed the Mamon La's spike of anger and come to intervene. To protect him. It shattered something inside him. Never had a female come to his aid. These Felotians would be dangerous indeed, if they ever realised how honourable to compassion the Verit males were. His boys would crawl over broken glass for the kindness and protectiveness she was showing him. No, my lady, she did not harm me. She is only a Mamon La and not capable of harming a full-fledged warrior. Only a Mamon La? So a Mamon is? Capable of harming a warrior? Lucius looked distinctly uncomfortable. It is not something we discuss with outsiders, but yes, the Mamon have their secrets and they can be dangerous in the extreme. He smiled crookedly at her. As are all females in their own way. I see, and this knowledge is born from your years of insight into the feminine mind, is it? She quipped. Unfortunately, yes. He paused and swallowed the intense emotions surging within, drowning in a deluge of memories of pain. She regarded him solemnly, and again he wondered how much she could sense. Thank you for your insight, First Warrior. She paused again, as if expecting him to add more, but as usual he could not summon the words. After an awkward silence, he bowed and took his leave, unable to shake the feeling that he had once again disappointed her.
Later that night, Dinara sat in the med bay monitoring the maman. Something scratched at her senses, an insistent feeling that she was being watched, faint emotional resonances that hinted at deception, secrecy. Twice she rose from her desk to double-check that the door to the lab was locked, that the storage rooms were empty. Her agitation increased steadily during the night, so that when Fila and Zira dropped by unexpectedly, bringing her a food tray from the mess hall, she was almost giddy with relief. Dinara, this is an intervention. You haven't left Med Bay for 16 hours. You need to eat and sleep. Dinara laughed at Fila's blunt manner as they pulled up chairs to join her at her desk. Oh, gimme. Dinara grabbed for the tray and began spreading the warm flatbread with a nutty protein paste before stuffing her face and groaning in delight at the flavour. In between bites, she continued, I can leave when Frey comes back on duty in a couple of hours. The maman have declined male healers, so there are only three of us able to monitor them, and Frey, Livia and Kirili have already been pulling double shifts. Fila and Zira ate their own meals more sedately, while they brought Dinara up to date on the gossip. It seemed like the two groups of colonists were slowly beginning to mingle, but the females were reading some alarming signs from the males. Zira frowned in confusion. They are deeply suspicious. I don't think they realise how much anger they are carrying and any sign of friendship is met with confusion and fear. Fila nodded. I can tell they are interested, but something is holding them back. She raked her hands through her hair, leaving the long waves dishevelled. The closest thing that I've felt is rescued abused animals, desperate for praise but waiting for punishment. Dinara paused, unsure about how much she should say. Naturally, the female sensed her hesitation. Spill, Dinara, you know something. She took her time, considering how to phrase it. This... It's not confidential, but it's private, you understand? The girls nodded. I did some research before we boarded on the history of the Verit colony. Several hundred years ago, they were embroiled in a vicious war. They were losing, their people dying by the tens of thousands. Even then, their birth rate was already declining. They always had a matriarchal society, and the matriarchs at the time decided to take action. Dinara paused, her fingers tracing the groves on the end of the tray. The choices they made, they are public record, and I'm sure they felt they had no choice. Their people were dying. Feely leaned forward expectantly. Just say it, Denny, what did those bitches do? They genetically altered their males. They spliced their genes with an assortment of different animal and synthetic strains. They built a super soldier. Fila and Zira sucked in shocked breaths. Fila curled her lip in disgust. Denny, genetic adjustments take decades to research. They can't have perfected them in time. Dinara looked at Fila, her champagne eyes haunted. They didn't perfect them. Oh, they worked well enough, but there were unintended consequences. Their males, they were prone to rages, they became berserkers. They would let them loose on the battlefield, and the males would kill the opposition until nothing was left alive. Sometimes they turned on each other. They became unable to function in normal society, prone to aggression at the slightest provocation. The girls sat in horrified silence. How could they do that, to their own people? Zira's words were hushed, appalled. Dinara continued doggedly. Over time, they ameliorated some of the effects with subsequent genetic alterations, but the result is still a highly aggressive, predatory male population, with very few females. The males began to turn on the females that had damaged them. In response, the females built in a control mechanism. Through genetic imperatives, pheromones and cultural conditioning, they have made it almost impossible for the males to disobey a verit female. They have coded into their DNA a deep desire to be close to, to obey, their females. Zira was incredulous. They mutated their own people, then turned on them for being what they made them. And this is the people that the Lakar wishes the females of Felosia to take as mates. Dinara nodded. Why weren't we told? Zira demanded. Fila jumped in. I suspect because of how you are reacting, they wanted us to give the mating a fair shot. Dinara hummed in agreement. Strictly speaking, they didn't hide it. The information is there if people look for it and put two and two together. Zira grabbed a nut from the tray and crunched as she mused. From what I have seen, the cultural conditioning still remains but is wearing down. I think the Marmon on Verit are still afraid of their monster children, and the males are at the end of their rope. If this colony doesn't succeed for them, 
I don't think their society will last more than a few more generations before it self-destructs. They sat in silence for a few moments. Then Fila asked, What are we going to do about it? Dinara smiled. I'm going to get to know them. Make my own decisions about how I progress. I haven't seen any violence from them. If anything, the opposite. They are protective but afraid of overstepping the mark. Zira nodded reluctantly in agreement. What about Lucius? What do you mean? Don't play dumb, Dinara. You can sense how he feels about you. Any time you walk into the room, he can't stop staring at you with those big blue eyes. Zira mimicked a lovelorn look, dramatically batting her eyelashes and had them all in chuckles. Dinara felt a pang in her chest that she deliberately pushed away. I can feel his interest, but he hasn't even spoken to me properly since our first chat. Lots of people feel attraction that they don't pursue for lots of reasons. She shrugged helplessly. On a colony specifically designed for mating, Fila was sceptical. Human template species are complex, you know that. Stupid, pesky emotions getting in the way. Maybe I remind him of an old lover that broke his heart, or I look like his mother. The girls cackled and Dinara sighed. It's a shame, though, he's gorgeous. But I won't push where I am not wanted. If he's been controlled by the mammal for so long and is carrying resentment, the last thing I want is to make him feel under pressure in any way. She shook off her low mood, picking up a cookie from her tray and throwing it at Fila. Besides, I am not sure I want a mate. Some fun, yes, but a mate. That's a big commitment and I have a history of poor life choices in that department. Fila snatched the cookie out of the air and took a big bite. Yeah, your dating history sucks. Zira nodded in agreement as Fila continued. But that was before you had us in your corner. Don't worry, Gila, your sisters have got your back this time. Dinara snorted out loud. I remember your dating history in school, Fila, darling. You cut a swathe through the senior girls, then did the same at uni. No one was safe. Fila stood up with mock injured dignity, prancing around the med bay dramatically. That is unfair. I loved every single one of them. A wicked glint shined in her eye as she spun around, sometimes two at a time. Dinara nearly choked on her own cookie she was laughing so hard, and Zira sniggered into her tea mug. I can't wait to see what the males make of Kirili and Sraya. Fila stilled. Oh, goddess, you don't think there are any male mated pairs here, looking for a female? Dinara and Zira paused. Such a thing was unheard of on Felosia. Males were so few. She knew it was common on some other planets, but for a Felosian female to have two males... Fila nodded decisively. I shall make it my mission to find out. Chapter 6, Landing Encrypted transmission, Agent Agrantau. Ammunition and catalyst supplies have been successfully diverted. Plan proceeding as scheduled. Agent on ground continues to monitor. Lucia stood in the storeroom, dusty and sweaty, and frowned at the inventory displayed before him. According to the manifest, there should have been six cases of Series M Perimeter Security Battalion bots and five cases of remote ultrasonic cannons. This was the last storeroom assigned to munitions, and Peyton and Tarlac had already been through the others and could not locate them. It appeared that a large quantity of munitions had disappeared. He tapped his HUD and placed a call to the Prime. Sorry to interrupt you, sir, but we have a serious situation. Explain! Lucius's response was crisp and professional. We are missing several critical armament and munition cases. They are on the manifests, but not in the stores. There was a pregnant pause. I see. I will bring the KDEC to meet you shortly. Yes, sir. Less than ten minutes later, the KDEC, the Prime and Lucia stood examining the manifests. You have examined the other security storerooms? Lucius nodded. Yes, my lady. The cadet glared at the cases in the storeroom, as if she could will the missing items to appear. We have several possibilities before us. The most palatable is that there has been a simple error, and they have been misplaced or mislabeled in another storeroom. We must ensure that this is not the case. My apologies, First Warrior, but I will need you to personally examine all other storerooms to ensure that they have not been misplaced. Lucius nodded, his face carefully blank. As the goddess wills it, my lady. She cocked her head, studying him. Whatever she saw, it softened her demeanour. Secrecy is the highest order here. I know that this is not something you would usually do yourself, but we must contain this until we know more. Eventually, Lucius nodded stiffly, and the Kadek continued. We must be certain. If it is not an error, then we are faced with less positive outcomes. 
Someone in the supply chain may have diverted or stolen the supplies or the funds for them. I will investigate this possibility. Both the Prime and Lucius nodded that time, their eyes distant as they processed the implications. The worst possible outcome is that we have a thief on board, and the munitions are here but hidden, to be used for an unknown nefarious purpose at some point. The males exchanged glances before the Prime answered, Before we start a witch hunt, let us eliminate the first two possibilities. The Kadek tapped her chin in thought. First warrior, if we cannot locate the stores, what impact does this have on our security perimeter? How compromised are we? Lucius pondered, gratified that the Kadek had asked his opinion. We can adapt. We had extra armaments with us in preparation for securing the Phase 2 and 3 sites to minimise transport costs. We can repurpose those, and we should be able to replace them before the end of Phase 1. The Prime turned to Lucius. Pull in whomever you think you can trust, but we need the inspection completed within the next two days before we reach Colony 29. The Kadek turned on her heel to leave. I reiterate, do it discreetly. We don't want to alert a thief if we have one. Make this look like a normal stock-taking. Find out if there are any other stores missing. I need to report this. The Kadek paced in her office, waiting for the comm to the Colonial Alliance to connect. Finally, there was a subtle beep indicating connection, and a friendly voice chirped. This is Administrator Kevlin of the... Kevlin, put me through to Amira. A pause and a gulp. Hello, Kadek. Mum. I'm afraid that Stai Delegate Amira... The Kadek cut him off. Now, Kevlin... I have been waiting five days for a reply to my report, and this is my ninth call. Kevlin paled. I'm sorry, Kadek, the delegate is extremely busy. Avoiding me. She is very busy avoiding me, and I'm done waiting. Tell her that she gets on the call with me now, or I will put the stowaways into an escape tube and jettison them, and she has three days to pick them up before they run out of oxygen. A longer pause. Hold, please. The Kadek resumed her pacing for several minutes before there was another beep, and the face of an annoyed Philosian female filled the screen. Morale, I do have a day job other than dealing with your crisis. The Kadek jabbed a finger at the screen. No, you don't, Amira. I am your day job. The sole purpose of your role in the Colonial Alliance Council is to represent Philosia's interstellar interests. Amira harumphed. Which is why I find it so confusing that you have not replied to my report. Two stowaways on the first wave of a new colony is big news. Add to that the fact that they were brought on by the Mammon Observer sanctioned by their convocation and that they stole and reverse-engineered the genetic enhancements and you and I should be living in each other's pockets. So why won't you take my calls? Amira let out a gusty sigh. Things aren't that simple, Morale. The convocation is being difficult. Make them undifficult. That's what you're paid for. They are clearly working outside colonial law. It shouldn't be that hard. Amira looked away. Well, yes, but this new colony is like a marriage. Do you want us to start it off with a dispute? Morale wasn't having a bar of it. If one of us isn't playing by the rules, you need to correct it fast before it gets out of line. We are in discussions and Verit will make reparations, but... But... We may need to concede to the girls staying there. It's cultural. Something about where the mammon goes, they go. Morale's jaw dropped incredulously. And they didn't feel the need to mention this before they sent the mammon. Or is this an ask forgiveness, rather than permission situation? Those girls put my ship in jeopardy. Their sloppy science nearly killed two miners. It's unacceptable. Amira sat back, her face neutral. It is absolutely unacceptable. We condemn it in the strongest possible terms. But it is not as simple as just shoving them out an airlock. It could be. No, it can't. You knew taking this assignment would expose you to more interstellar politics than just running station commands. And this is your first foray. The Kadek sighed. I hate it when you are right. And I hate politics. Amira exhaled a gusty sigh, placating now that the Kadek had capitulated. I know, just sit tight. A few more days and we'll have a compromise. Two days, Amira, or I put them in a pod, and they take a long flight in the dark. Amira threw her hands into the air. Fine, two days, I need to go. Not so fast, Amira, I have another issue. Shocking, Morale pointed at Amira in warning. Don't sass me, little sister. We have identified that we are missing some critical munition components. Amira leaned into the screen. Is your security compromised? We don't believe so. The first warrior believes we will be fine for phase one, but will need them replaced before we commence phase two. 
Amira shrugged. Well, that is indeed an unfortunate inconvenience. I can order you replacements. Don't be obtuse, Amira. You know the problem is not replacements. The issue is who took our armaments. I need you to investigate where in the supply chain they went missing. Amira regarded morale for a moment solemnly. Fine, I'll investigate. I can't promise anything. What does that mean? This is a significant security breach. Amira looked uncomfortable. What aren't you telling me, sister? Amira grimaced. A great many things, most of which are above your pay grade, morale. I will do what I can to investigate and order your replacements. Realising that pressing would only piss of Amira more, morale relented. I have the first warrior completing a full stock taking. I will let you know if anything is missing. Understood. Thank you for your report, Kadek. Say hi to Mum for me and Varys. I will. They miss you, so do I. Take care out there. You too. The Kadek ended the comm and wandered over to the view screen in her office. It projected a view from the outside of the ship so realistic she could swear she was looking out glass. The conversation with Amira made her very uncomfortable. Too many things unsaid or under the surface. This was why she had initially rejected this post. She was more suited to running a space station, where all she had to worry about were pirates, aliens, incompetent engineers and the odd asteroid. The next day, Dinara was surprised to find Lucius and Odrin in her medbay storeroom, inspecting the equipment that had been brought from Felosia. All around Lucius were opened crates as they examined each item, checking them off on the datapad. You know, First Warrior, it is poor form to enter into a medbay area without telling the chief healer, she quipped. He meticulously finished checking off the crate he had opened before he turned and bowed at her entrance. My apologies, my lady. I am completing a stock-taking at the order of the cadet. She laughed and walked in. It's all right, Lucius. I'm just joking. Can I help? I assume that there is a purpose to this other than just messing up my organization's schema. She motioned to the chaos of open crates. This room contains research equipment that I personally ordered and ensured was shipped and loaded. I did not want to trust security to the third-party contractor responsible for supplying the colony. It is all here. I have already gone through it. Lucius smiled a professional, tight smile at her. No, thank you. We are nearly finished with this room. I see. She looked around uncertainly, dubious at his response. Well, I'll be at lunch if you need anything. Lucius, we've been at this for hours. Why don't you go and grab us some food from the mess hall? Odrin chimed in. Lucius regarded Odrin incredulously while Odrin grinned, flashing dimples, and nodded at Danara hovering in the doorway. I've got this. Just bring me back some food. Lucius resisted the urge to make a face at him. All right, if you are sure. He turned to Danara. If you wouldn't mind company, healer. Danara beamed at him. Of course, you're welcome to join me. Danara watched him as he efficiently closed the transport cube he was working on. He had pulled up the sleeves of his jumpsuit, and his arms were corded in muscle. He had always drawn the attention of females, and usually it irritated him. He was aware that he moved silently for such a big man, an economy of movement and power that drew the eye. But with Danara, he watched her eyes trace his gold-dusted skin gleaming in the artificial light as he prowled beside her. It warmed something in him. Before long, they reached the mess hall. Unlike their more recent interactions, the silence was peaceful rather than awkward. Where before he was fumbling to make conversation, there was a new calm between them. He wasn't sure what had changed, but he could sense a difference in the air, and it perversely annoyed him. Are you prepared for landing? she asked. Indeed, inventorying the medbay store was the last pre-landing check I had to make. Me too. Everything is all locked up for landing in medbay, and the maman has been placed in a stasis pod for safety. I can almost taste it now. It's becoming real. We are really about to land on a new colony planet and start building a new society. Danara was animated when she spoke, using her graceful hands to illustrate her words. Her movements were elegant, and his eyes flicked to her strong wrists and neat, trimmed nails. The mess hall was a large, crescent-shaped room, with a selection of chairs, sofa groupings and booths dotted around, all in the bright primary colours that were ubiquitous on the Ardrak, spotlit by gentle overhead lighting. Against the dark grey of the walls and floors, the bright colours were islands of cheer, one entire wall was taken up with a giant viewing window, the blackness of space with a sprinkling of stars, a glorious moving backdrop to their conversation. 
They moved in sync to grab a tray and a bowl of the lunch special, some sort of vegetable soup with warm Elther bread and fruit. They took their seats in a secluded corner, greeting friends and colleagues in the last of the lunch traffic as they moved across the room to their selected booth. The mood in the crew was buoyant, the group's growing excitement palpable. Lucius could hardly believe that after all his clumsy attempts to make conversation, he was suddenly sitting sharing a meal with her. It was surreal. Feeling his heart flip as he took in her curvy form, he realised he was a complete idiot to have let his anxiety get in the way. The dark stranger within urged him to talk to her, to open up, to lay himself bare for her inspection. He wanted to get to know her, to learn her secret thoughts and places, to see her eyes light up in interest at what he had to say. Well, what shall we discuss, she prompted, as she began to peel a piece of dark purple fruit. She smiled at him gamely, and he noticed she had a faint tracery of wrinkles around her eyes. It made him absurdly happy to notice such a private detail. She must laugh a lot. He smiled at her in return, his eyes warming. While he wasn't ready to make himself vulnerable to any female, whatever the dark stranger urged, he couldn't deny the pleasure he drew in simply being in her presence. Ah, oh, there we go, a smile. We were beginning to think that none of you knew how, Dinara quipped. Lucius sat back in a relaxed sprawl, full of arrogance. What about Odrin? When he was my trainee, I often thought I would have to gag him to get a word in. Dinara took a bite of the light blue segment of fruit, chasing a drop of juice dripping down her hand, and he clenched, watching her tongue dart out to lick the sweet trail. He's a special case. He's more like a bubbly younger brother. Lucius thought he might keep that to himself. Odrin was very proud of how well he was interacting with the females on board. He would be disappointed if he knew that they saw him as an adolescent. They ate companionably for a few minutes before Dinara ventured. What made you decide to volunteer for the colony? Lucius chewed methodically, giving himself time to think, to choose his words carefully. I was ordered. The males here are all from the Dathalka clan, and I am the Dathalka first warrior. Dinara paused mid-bite to stare at him incredulously. Ordered? So you did not volunteer to come? None of you? You just came to live on another colony because you were told to? No, my lady. We go where we are ordered. Dinara was horrified. What? She spluttered. Will you take mates if ordered too? Lucius couldn't understand her distress. Yes, lady, of course. Dinara placed her hand over her eyes. Are you unwell, lady? Can I get you anything? She didn't look at him. My name is Dinara, she bit out, and yes, I think I'm feeling unwell, but not as unwell as your maman will be when I get a hold of her. When she looked up, Lucius was astounded to see the fury in her eyes. What in the name of the goddess is wrong with your people? Does the convocation really think that they can order people to live where they will, mate with some random female? How did they think we would feel, knowing that the males here don't even want a mate, that you are here out of duty? Clearly he had offended her. Damn it. This was why he had remained so silent. He had no experience interacting with females like her, let alone socially. I do not think they considered how you or we would feel at all, my lady, he replied stiffly. Dinara, you may call me Dinara, she said firmly. What does that mean? He shrugged. Just that the convocation makes their decisions for the benefit of Verit, and rarely considers the personal feelings of any one individual as a factor in their deliberations. Dinara reached out and placed a gentle touch on his arm. He felt her empathic probing, sensed her seeking for the old, old knot of rage and resentment within him, just under the surface of his titanium control. He wasn't an empath, but did his best to push her away. Please don't, he said simply. She blinked rapidly, her eyes shimmering, and he realised that her soft, empathic heart ached for him. Lucius had never seriously considered taking a mate before, he knew he was not well favoured by the maman, despite his look. They considered him too uncontrollable, largely only valuable for his military expertise. Years of dancing to their brutal whims had scoured him clean within. He was a hollow male, a shell of verite held together with glue and sheer determination. But the single gentle touch from Dinara seemed to reach into his soul. Long dormant emotions came rushing to the fore, screaming awake like a sleeping limb, and it took teeth-gritting focus to resist the urge to escape her touch, her piercing gaze that saw too much. He was an animal caught in a trap between his reluctance to place himself in any female's power and his conditioned desire for a mate 
and the closeness of female companionship. He wrenched himself away from his whirling emotions to force numb lips to speak. Do not fear, Dinara. Saying her name felt incredibly intimate. While my boys did not volunteer, they are beyond excited at this opportunity. Most of us would never have been granted permission to mate on Verit. The knowledge that they may have the opportunity to win mates of their own would have had all volunteering, had they been asked. Most of the males have never had the opportunity to form a bond with a female in any situation before. Surely they have interacted with females before us, even just friendships. This cannot be the first time they have tried to form relationships with females. Lucius paused, trying to gather his thoughts to explain the situation. How could he possibly explain the regimented existence of a Verit male to an outsider? The segregated training camps, the male-only communities, the training and conditioning of the males to the Maman's service. In his short time with the Felotians, he already knew that the Verit lifestyle was completely alien to them. Most of us have served on off-world missions and have had some interaction with females in very limited circumstances. Dinara smirked knowingly, and he ignored her expression. He wouldn't go near that discussion in a million years. He pushed on. Those interactions are unsatisfying. Verit males crave a close bond with a female. Until this colony, we have rarely been given permission to marry an off-worlder, so most males focus this desire on the mammons. His disgust was unhidden. The Mammon Convocation has strict rules against unsanctioned partnerships, and the opportunity to compete for a mate is the reward for good service. Her jaw dropped. Seriously? You've never dated? Had a fling? He shook his head. I do not know these words, but I understand your meaning and know. Verit males do not engage in casual relationships with females. In these last two weeks on the Ardrak, we have had more interaction with females than all of the rest of our lives put together. I see... I guess this will be a learning experience for everyone, then. They sat awkwardly, the tension simmering between them. Dinara braved a smile at him. You may want to undertake some research into the Philosian concept of dating. It is a social interaction where individuals interested in forming a relationship can meet in a social setting to get to know each other. If one of your boys particularly likes a female, you could try asking them out to the mess hall to eat. We call it a date, and it is an opening step in courtship. Lucius came to attention, a predator sensing blood. Is that what we are doing now? We are doing this, dating. Dinara was stunned. She paused in her consumption of her soup. This isn't a date. She scrubbed a hand across her forehead. This is just friends and colleagues having lunch. She leaned back, trying to gauge his mood. Besides, why would we be dating, Lucius? Dating is a prelude to courtship. You've barely spoken to me in days. He said nothing, she was right. Dinara didn't meet his eyes. It's all right, Lucius, I don't mind that you are only interested in friendship. I haven't had many male friends. I would value that relationship greatly. He warmed, genuinely touched. In all his years, no female had valued his company enough to desire a friendship. Still, he had to correct her misunderstanding. Thank you, Dinara. I would be honoured to be your friend. Dinara grinned at him, a bright open smile like the sun coming out. She gave her joy so freely, so unlike the manipulative mammon of his home world. I am sorry that I have been uncommunicative. I am unfamiliar with what to say to females in a casual setting. She barked a laugh. You speak as if we are another species. You might as well be. We know so little of you. Dinara nodded her understanding. However, I must correct your misunderstanding. I value your friendship, and if that is all you will offer me... I shall treasure it for the glory that it is. Lucius hesitated, his attraction for Dinara warring with his inbuilt caution. He could stop now, enjoy basking in her warmth as a valued companion, and never have to expose himself or his emotions to her. But he had the feeling that if he did, if he stepped back from the gentle promise he sensed between them, he might well regret it for the rest of his life. He swallowed and looked into her golden eyes. He did his best to pour steel into his spine. Courage, Lucius, what's the worst that could happen? She's here on a planet to find a mate after all. He swallowed again, his mouth dry, deluged with memories of pain and anger, shoving them back by sheer force of will. He would not let his history with the Mammons taint this new, fragile, precious thing with Dinara. He leapt. If you would consent, however, I would be grateful for the opportunity to forge a deeper connection. I would very much like the opportunity to explore with this dating you speak of. 
Dinara was speechless. Of all the ways she had imagined this conversation going, this was not it. After days of stonewalling and the conversation with Zira and Fila, she had finally convinced herself that he was not interested. She could feel his attraction, but she had surmised that it was purely physical or that he was not interested in pursuing her for some other reason. That's what you get for only using empathy, she thought. You feel the emotions, but unless you are a damned psychologist, it's easy to misinterpret why a person feels what they feel. She realised that she had not responded, and the hope she felt within Lucia started to flicker. She did not need her empathic senses to pick up on his emotional fragility, to understand that this, putting his feelings out there for her, was a huge step. She examined him, judging the sincerity of his declaration, before she slowly nodded. His breath caught, and suddenly after days of confusion and distance, they were right back in the med bay on day one, their connection as electric as ever. Lucia smiled, a slow, roguish grin. I shall research this concept of a date. It intrigues me. Dinara met his gaze boldly. You do that, she paused. One piece of advice. I am not interested in going on a date with someone that ghosts me. I do not understand this term. Perhaps you should add that to your list of social constructs to research. All personnel, attend posts and commence landing preparations. A flashing countdown appeared in the top right of Danara's vision, time to disconnection. Lucius reached over to Danara and offered his hand to her as they rose in response to the HUD announcement. I must attend my post. Thank you for your company, Danara. He bowed to her. Thank you, First Warrior. Next time we do this, it will be on our new homeworld. He smiled down at her. I would like that, Danara. They turned to leave, both pausing before the observation window as they watched the planet slowly enter into view. The planet that would be their home. Danara approached the window and pressed her hand against the cool screen, her eyes tracing the sight of Colony 29 in all its purple glory. It was roughly earth-sized, with a lilac hue, green-blue oceans covered with large floating algae islands, and green and purple landmasses dotted the planet. It was beautiful and Lucius felt hope rising within him on tiny gossamer wings. He stepped up beside her. Isn't it stunning? she asked softly. He nodded, staring at her profile intently. He was quite sure he had never seen anything so beautiful in his life as Danara, watching their new home, the light of the planet reflecting in her eyes. The ship rotated, the planet falling out of view as Colony 29 moved directly below them, as the central ring assumed geosynchronous orbit over the designated site for the first settlement. Taking a deep breath, Danara turned to him, eyes sparkling. Let's do it! Go start a new colony! She grinned mischievously. Danara? Yes? I'm glad I get to see this new colony with you. Danara smiled broadly, a warmth that he had come to recognise as uniquely her. She didn't say anything, just moved to place a hand on his arm for a fleeting instant. See you on the ground, First Warrior. Lucius stood, dumbfounded for a moment, unable to understand the sharp turn his life had taken. Surely the goddess was laughing at him. The dark stranger within was strangely quiet, contented and purring like a cat in his mind. He turned to attend his post when Peyton Parr sidled up to him, watching Dinara's retreating back in a manner usually reserved for wild animals, and whispered, Lucius, she sat down with you in public. I know. She ate with you, outside of work. He turned to regard him. I know. Peyton scratched his eyebrow. What does that mean? I have no idea. I don't think the rules of engagement have been written yet for this. Peyton turned to regard him. I'll make sure to take notes on all your screw-ups for future reference. The males nearby guffawed. Actually, I have an assignment for you. Find out what it means to ghost someone and why it would pertain to a romantic social interaction the Philosians call dating. Is this important? It could be your most important assignment in years. I shall make it a priority once we land. In the med bay, Danara sped through her pre-landing protocols, her HUD alert progressing to amber status, indicating the reducing countdown until med bay disconnection. Before she knew it, they were mere minutes away from landing. She completed her final checks with cool, professional detachment, all anxiety gone. She noted that her charges, the Mamonlas, had arrived, Odran locking them into the restraint harnesses along the right wall opposite the ISO rooms. Dinara walked along the line of harnesses, ensuring that her staff were correctly positioned and secure, before strapping herself in last. 
Med Bay. One minute to scheduled disconnection. Acknowledge all clear. With one last scan along the line of her staff, Dinara flicked an acknowledgement on her HUD and streamed the countdown to her team. All of the habitation and function pods would be disconnected from the central ring and remotely guided onto the ground into their pre-assigned positions, the individual pods becoming prefabricated buildings that would serve during the initial phases of the colony. The Ardrak central core would then become a supply shuttle and the transit ring disassembled over the coming months to become a comms relay beacon and satellites for the planet, augmenting the prelim satellites left behind by the scanning and survey team. This was why the Ardrak, and ships like her, were so sought after. Felosia had been lucky to be able to acquire one. They were efficient, nothing wasted. Her HUD alert flashed red, and Dinara closed her eyes as the medbay shuddered, then floated free, disconnecting from its umbilical to the central ring, and began to drift. A series of muffled thumps were the thrusters extending, before they kicked in and began manoeuvring the bulky pod towards the planet. The routine was automatic, locking into the homing beacons that had been shot into the colony site months before by the survey team. As they descended through the atmosphere, the pod began to shudder. A rectangular-shaped box does not make for a gentle aerodynamic flight. Through the tiny viewing window slits, she could see the red tinge of atmospheric friction before it gave way to a pale lilac light, daytime on the planet. The following few minutes were unpleasant as the pod went through a series of jerky motions as the thrusters blasted in turn to course correct, and her stomach made a real effort to lurch into her throat. Looking to her team, she saw many of them swallowing convulsively, and the Mammon Laz looked positively green. Dinara did her best to muster a reassuring smile, but she suspected it was more of a grimace. At last she felt all of the thrusters come on at once, slowing their descent velocity, and she realised that she could see treetops through the tiny window slits. With a gentle bump the pod landed, and she took a deep breath. All around them she could hear the metal of the hull clicking as it cooled, and the whine of the engines cycling down. Whoop! Can I go again? Her paramedic nurse, Kenan Saar, grinned from ear to ear, the youngest of her team. That was incredible! Dinara detached her harness and proceeded to the med bay door, which now functioned as an airlock to the outside. Accessing the pod's rudimentary sensor array with her HUD, she waited for the scanning cycle to run. One by one, the markers on the display turned green. Green across the board, who wants to do the honours? Dinara turned to her team, motioning to the control to open the door. Who wants to go first? Odrin promptly stepped forward to their collective laughter. All right, you can go first. Don't leave the med bay perimeter field until we know that all the other pods are down and you get authorization. Odrin stepped up to the control, took a deep breath and hit the release. The airlock hissed as the oculus retracted, and they clustered through into the secondary door. At the secondary release beep, Odrin paused a moment, and the group waited in anticipation. Turning to him, Dinara was going to ask him if he was all right when she saw his smirk. Cuffing him gently on the back of his head, she said, Enough dramatics, you open the damn door. He winked cheerfully to the groans of the others and hit the final release. The airlock opened and they crowded out on the gantry of the medbay pod, raised from the layer of soft lilac moss and brown dirt by a walkway a foot above the ground. The sight was incredible. The survey team had selected a plateau for their first settlement location, large and flat, on the side of a valley next to a freshwater river leading to an ocean. Sheltered by the valley, they had some protection from storms. All around them the pods from the ship dropped into position, arrayed in standard colonial formation, with the medical, administrative, communal and living pods forming a central hub around an enclosed courtyard slash green. The central hub was in turn surrounded by the industrial pods of power, water, livestock, stores, engineering and fabrication, agriculture, aquaculture, biodomes for test planning, vehicle pools, security. The list went on and on. All of the essentials required to support a new colony, in turn surrounded by a physical and electronic defence perimeter, comprised of automated sensor and guard towers. It was a spectacular sight, the pod's hulls glistening in the sunlight, the roar of their thrusters as they dropped into place. The pale grey pods were backdropped against a range of green and grey trees, beyond which was a glistening river, lazily weaving its way down the valley. 
Dinara noted that her suit had adjusted her temperature, a little cooler than most Velotians would prefer, but manageable. As the last of the Ardrak pods dropped into position, the all-clear flashed in everyone's HUD. There was a moment of silence before the cheers echoed through the valley. Looking around, Dinara could see the colonists standing on the gantries of their respective pods, hooting. She stepped down the short drop onto the dirt and moved to the centre of the open square formed by the central hub pods. With each step she took, she felt herself attuning to the energy of the planet. The key deck raised her arms when she stepped from the colonial administration pod and sent a summons across the Felosian female frequency. It manifested as a pulsing harmonic bass. All of the Felosians disembarked from their pods and walked to the centre of the open ground. When Dinara reached the middle, she removed her boots and sunk her toes into the earth. Sinking down to her knees, she stilled her inner centre, readying to open her mind to the energy of the planet. She reached her arms up to the sky before letting them drift down to touch the outstretched fingers of her sisters kneeling on either side of her, each joining her own harmony to the Cadex. The Verit males had fallen silent, aware that something was happening among the females which they did not understand. The Philosians formed a kneeling circle, each connected to her sisters at her fingertips as they turned their faces to the sky. They began to vary the frequency of their sound, to weave their energies together to harmonise with the standing wave pattern of their new planet, sending out a gentle pulse to the trees and the ground beneath them. Surprisingly, they felt the energy wash back towards them immediately, warm and deep and welcoming. The welcome ritual was practised in all Felotian colonies, cities and towns. The attunement often took years. The depth of energy they were receiving at Colony 29 was akin to that of their most sacred sites that had hundreds of years of alignment. The Verit males first felt it as a thrumming in their bones and a scent of green growing things wrapping around them. Gradually the energy moved into the visible light spectrum, surrounding the females in a luminescent silver glow that pulsed gently for a few moments before settling into the moss and dissipating. They knelt for long minutes singing to the planet. The sound wrapped around the males, its beauty and warmth settling into their muscles, encouraging them to relax, to lay down their burdens for a moment. It was indescribable. Many of the males muttered prayers to the goddess in both joy and fear. In time, the females lowered their arms and knelt forward to touch their foreheads to the ground. The Kadek was the first to rise from her kneeling position, holding a handful of soil above her head, letting it slowly trickle out as she paced the inside of the Philosian circle. As she spun, she spoke to the males. This planet welcomes us. It is strong and happy to have new life on it. We have formed a connection which will grow in time to enable us to make this place abundant. The Verit males held their breath, spellbound. This feminine energy was unlike anything they had experienced before. She turned and held her hand out to Brown to join her, and he walked into the centre of the females, head held high, betraying nothing of his awe or anxiety. Let's mark this occasion. She motioned for him to give her his hand. The cadet placed her hand with the remaining dirt over his and concentrated, from their joined hands a warm glow emanated. Eventually she removed her palm, and a small shoot with a tiny flower had sprouted from the dirt in their cupped hands. Brown stared at the plant, speechless. Let's work together to build a colony our children and grandchildren will be proud to call home. <laughs>